Thank you, Andrea, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's a, uh, uh, first of all, a pleasure to be uh, back in Italy. Um, but uh, it's also a big honor uh, to be uh, asked to be a plenary speaker following uh, one, of the, um, one of the world's greatest uh, scientists today, John Delaney. Um, and uh, it's, uh, uh, as John was talking about, and there's, uh, he, he has a, a habit of, uh, of expressing all his, uh, his visions, uh, in particular when, uh, when sitting over a beer in the bar. And uh, I really would encourage the, uh, the audience here to, to do that. Uh, we as engineers, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure the, uh, you as, uh, um, as, as, well as, I, as, as well as I do, um, uh, are quite intimidated by these scientists with these big visions. And uh, uh, just, just remember that uh, von Kármán said, uh, scientists dream about doing great things, engineers do them. So I really, I really think you should, you, should take up, you should take up John on the, uh, uh, on the invitation and have a beer with him, because that's really where he's coming up with these really crazy ideas. Uh, and he was, uh, and, but on the other hand, because of people in this room, and people like people in this room, um, the, uh, the vision that, uh, that John had, um, the one he threw up and put my name on, um, is, uh, is very close to actually happening. And uh, it's, re it's really an exciting time in that uh, regard, and it's, it's a really a pleasure to be here and to talk about that. Now, uh, I'm uh, even worse than John, and more notorious in terms of running over time. So, um, the, uh, and, and one of the things you always have to leave out in the end is the acknowledgement. So I'm going to start off with the acknowledgement. Uh, first of all, the, uh, my staff and students back at MIT, without, uh, which, uh, without whom, whom none of this work would have happened, uh, but also the collaboration with, uh, uh, with CMRE, or as, it, uh, as I prefer to know it, Sacklandson, um, because I spent a lot of, uh, several years, a total of seven years uh, um, at, um, at Sacklandson and NERC, um, and the people I've over the years have been, uh, have the pleasure of working with, and uh, I'm sure that this list is far from, com uh, far, far from complete. Um, it represents people, some of it which uh, are in this room, but I'm sure that uh, I forgot somebody um, because it really has been a tremendous, and the, a, a, a tremendous time we've had together uh, during all the cruises we've had. And uh, I list all the cruises over to the right, um, the, uh, where we, we have actually, in, in the work we are doing at MIT, we've been involved in many more cruises with, uh, with, uh, with NERC and CMRE than we have uh, with uh, uh, our funding agencies in the United States. Uh, but either, of course, have been important for, for where we are, and of course, the funding by the various agencies uh, uh, is uh, highly appreciated. So, what I'm going to talk about is the um, is uh, the uh, some of the really the, the history and and particularly my experiences uh, going through about 20 years now of uh, working with uh, with underwater uh, uh, with marine uh, underwater systems. Um, and um, in particular, coming from the uh, uh, area of acoustic sensing, which is really how I made my career. That's what I did when I was uh, at uh, uh, Sackland in the first place, uh, uh, developing numerical models for uh, sound propagation in the ocean, um, and then starting thinking about how can we, well, when this uh, technology was emerging, how can we take advantage of that uh, for acoustic sensing? So that's my, ex that's where I'm coming from, and that's what I'm, I'll try to do to give you some some uh, uh, ideas about what, am, what, am, what is my experience in doing that. Um, and uh, this is basically the outline of my talk, and I'm not going to spend time on talking about the outline. Uh, uh, for obvious reasons, I'm going to go on to, the, uh, uh, to the more of the uh, content. And this is, the mo this is, in my view, the most important slide. Uh, it's 10 years old now. Uh, John Potter thinks that I stole it from him, uh, like a few of the other slides, but it's probably the other way around. That's, at least that's my claim. Um, but um, it's the, the communication environment that we are facing uh, uh, in the underwater environment. Uh, if we think about each of us in this room sitting with a computer, we can network them uh, instantaneously without any significant effort on anybody's part. Uh, they can talk to each other, they can talk to the cloud, they can talk to everybody, everybody can talk to everybody. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. And John was talking about this, this swarm of robots, and I'm going to talk more about that later on. Um, and, uh, and the beauty of 
the, uh, uh, of the cable infrastructure. Unfortunately, the cables doesn't read, the, the, the fiber optic cable, John, doesn't reach out to those critters. They have to work, they, they have to be uh, uh, maybe connected at some point, but then they're going to be out on their own. And if we want to control them, we have to communicate with them. Um, and uh, we are going to be faced with this communication environment. And it's a, it's really a layered communication environment, and that is really what is the most important constraint for the development of underwater or marine robotic systems. So if we think of having a platform like an AUV or a glider or a mooring um, on board uh, that, uh, that node or one of, one of John's uh, critters, uh, we, have, we have Ethernet. So we have virtually infinite uh, bandwidth, uh, and we can uh, have the uh, uh, we can have information passing from the sensors uh, through processing chains and over to uh, uh, to the uh, control of the uh, of the platform. Uh, so we can have these various components on board the uh, the node communicating with each other and collaborating. And the control loop is very fast, so we can we can use sensor information, feed that back to the uh, autonomy and to the, con to the control, and, uh, um, and do that within, within microseconds. Is this not, not, not working anymore? I don't think the pointer is working anymore. Anyway, okay, uh, so let me just speak to it. Uh, so now the, so that's what we, so what we are dealing with, if we are doing control loops on, the, on each node, we do that in a, in a, in a matter of microseconds. If we have to have two of these platforms uh, talking to each other, uh, we are facing a very different, thank you, a very different, uh, a very different communication environment. There we basically have to talk acoustically between the platforms, um, except when we are really at very close range. And the, the rate we're looking at there is, in our experience, and I know that there are people in the room uh, who is going to jump at me afterwards and yell and scream at me and say this is not true, but the design number we are using, and that is based on 20 years of experience of doing this, is 100 bytes per minute, point to point. That's what we have to deal with when we have these platforms uh, uh, talking to each other. Now, if we want to then, so if we do want to do collaboration between these, we're talking about do, doing collaboration on time scales of minutes. Now, if we want to get even further up and getting the operator, getting John, John Delaney involved, um, then uh, we, uh, we have to go through back up to the operator and from the underwater world, getting back up to uh, the, uh, uh, the system. If we don't, if we're not near one of the, uh, the cable nodes, um, we'll have to move and get into one of the cable nodes, and that takes some time. So we have some latency, um, and the order magnitude is 30 minutes. That's used, again, the design criteria we're using nowadays. Uh, also, another possibility is going to the surface and talking by a satellite. But, uh, so the data rates are higher up at that level, but the, uh, 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 but the latency is significantly, uh, significantly bigger. So if we want the operator in the loop, we, just as a grand general rule, we're talking about hours. We can look at phenomena controlling the assets underwater on, for, for uh, investigating phenomena that are of the, of the scale of, uh, uh, of ours. So now if we really want to do things more efficiently, looking at small scales, small, uh, uh, small time scales, we really have to do it down here. And this is where this whole idea of, uh, uh, of uh, nested autonomy is, uh, uh, is coming into the picture, which is the title of my, uh, my talk. So if another way of looking at, looking at this is uh, this uh, trade space for, uh, on, for, for, uh, for system performance. It has a three axes, the communication uh, capacity in uh, just a rough number, byte times the, the distance in kilometers per minute. Um, and when, when we're talking land-based, air-based systems uh, like uh, the, uh, the Predator drones uh, flying over the, uh, uh, in the, over the Middle East, in the Middle East, they can be controlled by a pilot sitting back uh, in his living room in the United States. Um, we're talking about 10 to the 12th um, uh, byte kilometer per, per minute as the uh, uh, communication rate. So we really don't need much, uh, uh, much in terms of, uh, of autonomy because we have the operator, he can fly the plane. Uh, you don't need anything but an auto autopilot, basically. Now, if we look at a submarine, a submarine is underwater for a long time. Uh, it has a very, uh, uh, very capable crew. It has great sensors, so that's how it gets its uh, performance. It doesn't communicate 
it doesn't need to communicate. He prefer, they prefer not to communicate. Um, they are on their own. They have a full crew with all the capabilities they need, and they have sensor systems. Now, there's a fourth axis on this trade space, and that's price. Uh, I, didn't, I have never figured out how I got that fourth axis on there, but um, the, uh, the sub, of course, is 10 times more expensive than uh, even the a swarm of 100 vehicles like, uh, uh, like John Delaney's. But it is really the most capable underwater system we have today, and at least in terms of acoustic sensing. So now what do we do with these small robots? Well, we don't have the sensor uh, capability. We don't have the ca communication capability we, because we're down here to the 10 to the third, nine orders of magnitude less. There's no way we can do the centralized control. So what we have to do to get the performance is to add intelligent autonomy in terms of situation. The, the, you have to understand what's uh, happening around you, uh, and you have to be able to adapt. You have to uh, make contingencies when things are not working out correctly, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that's what we are dealing with. Those are the constraints. Um, and uh, the, uh, when we are talking about developing these underwater systems, of course, it all depends on the mission, but the one I've been focusing on is uh, undersea surveillance systems. There are certain requirements. Um, so the, uh, uh, we, uh, the, we want to be able to do acoustic remote sensing, uh, because you don't want it, the sensors to run around and touch everything. Um, and uh, so, so we're talking about coverage of orders uh, at 10 to 100 kilometers uh, for each node. Uh, and uh, resolution of order uh, 100 to, to 1,000 meters in, uh, uh, in, in our surveillance. We have to be aware of the environment because otherwise we cannot adapt to it. Um, we have to be aware of the tactical pictures, where the, other, where the surface ships so we don't run into them or get run down by them, for instance, using AIS information. Um, persistence, that's a key. Uh, we're talk we're, nowadays, we're talking about 30, 90 days of deployments. Um, uh, and maybe at full water depth, 6,000 meter uh, water depth. The most important one is resilience. Um, and it's something that we often, as engineers, don't think about. Because when we are developing algorithms, where if you're doing signal processing, for instance, and uh, uh, oops, it didn't, it, that doesn't work quite right, we'll tune the track a little, uh, stop the process, redo it, etc. You don't have that luxury if your vehicle is at 6,000 meter depth. Uh, so robustness to planned and uh, unplanned event is absolutely key to the uh, resilience of these, uh, of these systems. You basically have to be ready for the Apollo 13 event, uh, which of course is un unpredictable, but you have to be able to, to act to it. You have to have some systems in place that can make the decision making uh, for when, when those things happen. Fault alarm control is very important. You don't run off uh, just because you hear something. Uh, you have to make sure it's the right thing you're running off for. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the constraints, and, uh, uh, and they're li listed over here with that. But again, as I mentioned, the most important one I find is the, uh, in my experience, is the communication uh, environment. So then, so that, and then to define the, uh, the, the what, I, what I call nested autonomy, is an autonomy system that is able to adapt uh, to the tactical and environmental situation. So the sensing node, the basic idea is that each node has to be capable, capable of completing the mission objectives on its own. If it's cut off from the rest of the world, it's maybe not doing the, the mission perfectly, but it's capable of completing the mission without talking to any other vehicle, without talking to the operator. Uh, it has to be able to do that. Um, on the other hand, when we have connectivity, we'll take advantage of it and do collaboration between, uh, uh, between nodes. Uh, they, have to, the, the, they have to be, as I mentioned, mission resilience. Uh, they have to be ca capable of reacting to a full spectrum of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, no, of predictable and unpredictable uh, events. Um, and we do that with the, uh, with the behavior-based autonomy that is basically that has the behaviors in there, but has no scripting. It has behaviors in there that is, allows it to, to react to these uh, unforeseen events. And then persistence, um, because uh, on the previous slide, I had the typical battery life you have nowadays, maybe allows you to run 10 days on an AUV. Um, we wanted 90 days. How do you get there? Well, you can keep developing uh, power technology, but also you can use intelligent con-ops 
shutdown systems, uh, um, drift, and uh, um, and if, if you're not, if you don't have to do anything, etc., that is really a key to many of uh, uh, of these uh, uh, many of these systems. Um, the um, uh, finally, the the way we do this is really to to uh, do what I what I call integrated sensing, modeling, and control, which is uh, where the idea is really that we have to have everything on board that allows us to complete the mission and uh, and uh, uh, and take act uh, take the proper action in uh, uh, in these contingencies. Um, so the way we do that is automated processing of data makes sense. Um, of acoustic data, non-acoustic data, etc., and you're doing all the data fusion on board uh, in support of the system. Um, and uh, then you, uh, you are able to model what is going to happen because these vehicles, they move at a relatively low speed. Uh, the ocean is changing. So it really doesn't matter what happens at this point in time where I am. It, what matters is where am I? Where is my target uh, event that I'm looking at? Uh, uh, minutes, hours from now, because that's really what affects my decision making. So we have to be able to model and forecast on board the, uh, uh, these uh, vehicles, because then remember, they have to do it on their own. And we have this, this intelligent decision making, um, the, which is, is really the, uh, uh, the key enabler enable that's based on the situational awareness, looking at what's happening, and then uh, uh, having these behaviors uh, that have a built-in, that really have uh, represents the strategies that we have built into the system for how to react to these uh, these situations. And then finally, learning, which is something we're going into, uh, and which I'm going to talk a little about uh, later on. So really, what the, another way of looking at this is that we really want these these nodes to be a complete uh, a complete vehicle just like a submarine, and we talked about the submarine. And so what, really what we want to do is we want to cl clone everybody that has a role on that, uh, uh, on that submarine. Uh, or on a, in most of what, what we are doing is research, so it's a, a, uh, uh, we have a chief scientist that's deciding what to do. So I have uh, our, our John, La John Delaney up here as, a, as an example of a chief scientist, so we basically want to clone John, putting him down there so he can make decisions uh, and tell the captain, uh, as the chief scientist will do on a research vessel like the Alliance, captain, I would like to do this and I'd like to do that. Now the captain, and here I have uh, the, uh, the admiral, um, who uh, actually fills in a, a role both as a fleet commander, um, but he also has a background as a submarine commander. So the captain of the ship is really the one that actually execu that executes the chief scientist's uh, uh, instructions, and he does so, um, maybe he says, no, I'm not going to do that, because he has a lot of other objectives. Uh, first of all, keeping the crew safe, keeping the ship safe, not using too much power, not using too much water, whatever it is we're talking about. So that is where the, these two really have to be there together and, uh, uh, and make, make, the, uh, uh, make the proper, uh, proper decisions. And then we have the people who are actually doing the signal processing, for instance, or the acoustic modeling, et cetera, so I'm just an example. Um, and uh, as, you, as you note, uh, I didn't include the previous speaker on this uh, because the, we really don't need the policymaker on board the vehicle. Uh, he's doing a much, much better job and more important job in, ra in, uh, in raising all that money uh, up in these, uh, from his office in, uh, uh, in Brussels. So I put Toby, who was a past student of mine, who was in the, at the meeting, because I had to have somebody in the picture who, had, who was at the meeting, but he happens also to be a, uh, our communication expert, um, and he's giving a talk later on uh, Thursday on that. So we have to clone Toby as well. One thing we are excluding is uh, the, uh, uh, the lower level platform control, and I'm going to, uh, uh, because he, uh, we have a lot of different uh, manufacturers of underwater vehicles out there, and uh, rather than buying a, a blank vehicle from them and then trying to do the dynamic control of the vehicle, et cetera, um, we don't want to do that. The, the, the vehicle manufacturers are much better than that. So the lower level vehicle control, the native software that allows you, that allows the vehicle to react to commands of the, what the captain will usually do is saying speed, heading, and depth. Uh, we let the vehicle manufacturers make the software that actually makes that into actuator commands 
and also provide the basic navigation, which is feeding back to the captain of the ship. So we're not dealing with that, and I'm going to talk a little more about that later on, how we, how we separate that out. But that's an important component because it allows this, this crew uh, to really work on any research vessel in the world or any submarine. Uh, um, it really doesn't matter because the roles are the, uh, the, roles are the same. And the captain of, the, of one submarine can just jump on another one, and it doesn't even have to be the same make. Uh, they do that all the time. Okay, so the, uh, in terms of the design approach we then uh, have adopted for developing these systems uh, is first of all that since we want to clone these guys, these domain experts, um, there no, there's nobody really better at doing that than the, uh, that the, uh, um, the domain experts themselves. Now they may not have all the skills for doing that and putting that into uh, uh, into codes. Uh, uh, maybe a, the, maybe they aren't able to write C++ code, uh, or, uh, or or maybe they don't even know what a computer looks like. Uh, and so they they may need they need some help. So we need the computer scientists uh, then to um, develop the cloning tools. So that is the system architecture, and I'm going to say a few words about that. Um, the uh, middleware, how are these various processes, the sonar guy and the captain and the, uh, uh, and the chief scientist, how are they talking to each other? Um, and an example is Moose, which uh, uh, is made by Paul Newman at Oxford, and uh, which we are using, and I'm going to talk more about that. And then with the decision, the decision making, which is then the, uh, it's, uh, taken care of by the, uh, uh, in our case, by the IVP, which was developed by, my, uh, by, Mike, ben by uh, Mike Benjamin. And then we have the domain experts developing the, a the applications, like uh, applications for your, for your cell phone, um, whether it's in, uh, uh, in sonar processing, modeling, et cetera, et cetera. That's what they're focusing on. You don't let the computer scientists do that because they probably don't have a clue about what's happening out in the ocean. They haven't, don't have a clue about the acoustic environment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they know a lot of other things, but they don't know that. So it's, this team is uh, absolutely uh, uh, critical. And then finally, think out of the box. It's not a man's sub. And there are things you can do and, uh, that uh, you cannot do with a man's sub, and I'm going to give an example in a moment. Um, and, uh, uh, and you shouldn't be, uh, be, uh, be too risk adverse, because it may keep you from doing things that you, that you could do. And then the, uh, the thing that we have found to be extremely useful is to, to work with an, uh, uh, with an open ar software architecture, because it allows these domain experts to actually get templates, actual, so actual source code, where they just need to put in two or three lines of a particular algorithm, and they have an operating uh, application. That's an extremely, we've, we found that to be absolutely critical uh, to the uh, development of these systems. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the, uh, this, uh, further on the, uh, on the design principles, there are really three ma ma uh, basic components. The first one is the separation of the payload from the base vehicle. And that's what I talked about earlier. We don't, we don't want to bother with the lower level control of the vehicle. We let the manufacturers do that. We'll take care of the payload, but we are taking the captain of the ship. He goes into the payload. The, um, the payload software is run using a middleware, in, the, in our case, Moose, uh, and then you have these applications. So all you need to know is really the interfaces between these modules and the, uh, uh, the middleware, um, and that interface definition is really what guides the uh, application developers, which these, then are these various domain experts, the acquisition, the signal processor, et cetera, et cetera. There's one process, that's a helm, that's a captain. Uh, and the captain is, uh, has a set of uh, predefined modes um, for the, uh, that is coded into the vehicle ahead of time, but these are not fixed, they're not scripts. They're just modes he's in, and I'm gonna say a few words about that. Um, and in each mode, there's a set of behaviors defined, and these behaviors, again, are not fixed, they're not scripted. Uh, a uh, hexagonal loiter can be put anywhere in the world, any depth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, but they are basic behaviors that, uh, the, uh, that we present the expertise of these domain experts, as well as the captain. Don't run into something. Um, and uh, these, uh, these uh, by the way, these, uh, the, uh, this concept was developed by David Battle back in 2004, Paul Newman 
uh, develop uh, moves back at M when he was at MIT in 2002, and then Mike Benjamin, who's still working with me, developed the IVP, uh, the, really the key app captain of the ship, in uh, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at Newark, and he's now working with us at, uh, at MIT. So how does that now look on the, on the actual vehicle? So here you have the, the, the clone guys, the sensor management, uh, modeling, etc., the mission manager, the admiral, or the chief scientist, the communication, um, and the captain of the ship with the modes and the behaviors uh, uh, predefined. It's all connected to this middleware. Now, there's one, the important thing for this, from this, to take away from this, is that there's really only three connections from this system, from, from all the colored boxes, which represents what we call the payload autonomy or the platform autonomy. Um, there's three connections to the outside world. One is the sensing system. Another one is the vehicle dynamics. So that is what comes with the, with the vehicle I buy. That's what the manufacturer is taking care of. But that interface is well defined and that interface can be well defined. The last one is the communication, the interface to the modem, again, that can be defined. So those are the three connections to the outside world. And that's gonna be important, uh, uh, be important later on when we talk a little about uh, simulation. So, uh, so moving on, uh, the, uh, the concept of operation then is that we define this hierarchical uh, mode structure uh, and this mode structure happens, um, we didn't know that when we started up doing this, but it ha actually happens to be more or less unchanged going from one mission to another mission, whether it's for oceano oceanographic measurements, for acoustic measurements, etc. It's basically the same kind of thing. There's some deploy modes. You can do deploy in lawn lawnmower, you can deploy in uh, hexagonal loiter patterns, you can do racetracks. Uh, in depth, you can do yo-yos, you can do constant depth, etc., etc. And then, Reacting to events in the environment, we go prosecute. We can prosecute. First of all, we search for the event. Uh, where is it? Then we try to classify it, figure out is, what, what is it? Is it actually the front I was looking for? And then finally, going in and mapping and uh, uh, mapping and uh, uh, and tracking it. And all of this has to be built into the modes ahead of time, and in the uh, behaviors except there's one very important feature here, and that is that these, all these behaviors are dynamic, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so even though the, uh, the, the, the behavior says, well, I, this, is, this is how you do a hexagonal uh, loiter pattern in, uh, uh, in depth, that's all that's coded in there. The radius, the depth, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, how many is it a hexagon or an octagon or whatever, all that is programmable with very simple commands from the, uh, from the top side or from the onboard uh, uh, chief scientist. Um, so how does this work? And this is an example. So here you have these two vehicles. Uh, these are surface craft, uh, Gilda and uh, Henry. And they have this pretty stupid uh, mission of uh, running uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a hexagon and then just going over and switching uh, switching space, uh, uh, one going over to the other one, and vice versa. The, all these guys n communicate to each other. It's a status, basically navigation information. Where am I? So what you'll see is that Gilda has a, the, and this is the way the behaviors work, is that we have, we basically onboard generate in real time a, an objective function, in this case for speed, which is a radius, and uh, uh, heading, which the, uh, is, the, uh, is the azimuth, red means it's a desirable one, blue means don't go there. And what you see is that when Gilda is starting over here, it has a red going east. Um, and uh, that's, what, that's what happened in a moment. Um, and um, that's all it knows. Then at some point it gets a, a message from Henry, I'm on my way. So then you see this blue region that's pointing towards Henry, I don't wanna go there. So this is the way the captain is making the decisions. He basically take the domain experts are developing these behaviors with Mike Benjamin's algorithm, put them together in a very efficient way, and then the captain just says, okay, I have a peak at this speed, this, that, this, uh, this heading, and that's what we're gonna do. And that's what in this case is allowing these to do this while uh, uh, avoiding running, uh, running into each other. And this is, a lot of this software is available. Um, you, can, uh, you can download it. There's about 100,000 uh, 
lines of, uh, uh, of public code, uh, and there's a lot of documentation, and I'm not going to spend time on the, uh, on the details, uh, but you can go in on the web and, uh, and find it. You search for Moose IVP, and uh, uh, there's a lot of material uh, available. These are some of the vehicles, some of them, that have been, uh, uh, have been ad uh, uh, adopting the Moose IVP um, autonomy infrastructure. The latest one, which is actually happening right now, is Phoenix International. I don't know if Phoenix is uh, known in, uh, on this side of the Atlantic. Phoenix was, is the uh, sur surveying company that was uh, uh, running the search for, uh, for Malaysian Airlines 370 uh, with an underwater vehicle, and they're switching now to, uh, uh, to our uh, uh, Moose IVP uh, software infrastructure basically doing this nested autonomy with, uh, platform autonomy we are doing. So the way we, we have this organized is in a, uh, in a nested repository. Paul Newman is maintaining Moose at Oxford. At MIT, Mike Benjamin is maintaining the MIT tree. And uh, these are just some of the, uh, this, uh, the Moose represents, uh, I think, what, what does it say? Eight man years of development effort. Um, it's very small, totally self-contained. There's no dependencies. Mike Benjamin's uh, in the MIT tree uh, represents about 27, uh, 27 man years. And then there are other repositories for, the speci for specific government programs, et cetera, that are nested around these, but these are the basic ones. And it really is a roadmap for collaboration because what did we do at CMRE in 2008? Uh, was basically adopting this software, putting it on the OEX and uh, um, there was one, uh, the, uh, uh, Marco Mazzi, I, I don't know if Marco is here, he and I, uh, one night on the, at the on the Alliance, uh, conspired to put the payload autonomy on the OEX uh, over the objections of his boss who went to sleep a little earlier. So uh, Marco wor worked all night with one of my engineers and we had the, uh, uh, the Moose IVP software running the OEX in the, uh, the next day. And uh, the rest is history. These are the, these are the Moose apps uh, and behaviors that uh, the center has been developing uh, since 2008. And this is, I'm sure this is incomplete. It increases every day. They just came back from a cruise in Norway where they used all this, uh, this stuff, uh, stuff as well. So at MIT, we have various, uh, uh, various um, projects that, uh, um, that, uh, that we, we have the basic Moose IVP development that's funded by Battelle and by ONR. Uh, we're involved in a, in a couple of DARPA programs. Uh, for deep ocean uh, um, active sonar programs. Then uh, the, uh, our, our students uh, were involved in the uh, Robot X competition in Singapore uh, last fall uh, with this, uh, this surface craft, and uh, uh, they actually went ahead and, uh, and won, the whole, uh, won the whole thing. So we we're pretty proud of, uh, proud of that, and there's a paper being, uh, being published. Uh, we're working with Olin College, uh, and Drew Bennett from Olin is here with uh, some of the students he had involved in that program as well. Uh, we, uh, Mike Benjamin is really fond of competitions, so we have this hunter prey competition where you have one team running an underwater vehicle in the Charles River, another team running a surface craft with a sensor, uh, and one having to track and uh, track down and drop virtual depth charges on the other one. He's also doing a lot of work on, uh, on the collision avoidance. You saw the collision avoidance earlier. That was a pretty standard collision avoidance with no rules <coughs> guiding it. Colrex, of course, the official rules, and we are doing a lot of stuff, in particular a couple of our Navy students is involved in uh, developing uh, collision avoidance behaviors for surface craft that are consistent with the Colrex regulations. Um, another competition is uh, Aquaticus, which is just starting now under DARPA funding. Uh, it's, a, it's a competition uh, where you have a, a manned uh, 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 surface craft, uh, a MOKAI as it's called in this case, um, and an autonomous surface craft working together, um, basically uh, 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 playing a game on the river um, to, uh, uh, to uh, against, uh, playing against other teams for, uh, for gaining some, uh, some uh, objective. So the, um, the, uh, uh, so I'll say a few words about the, uh, the, simu the simulator, and uh, uh, these are some of the, uh, uh, this, this is really the motivation, and the motivation is really that, first of all, that the, ex the uh, that at sea experiments are extremely expensive, and we have been uh, lucky enough that we could work with the center on doing a lot of our uh, uh, experiments at sea with them. Um, but um, it's not enough. We, we, we have found that we need about a thousand times as many hours 
uh, for testing the systems in uh, in virtual experiments or in, in in actual or virtual experiments, as we have time and money for doing with real uh, uh, real research vessels. So we need a virtual environment, um, and uh, we. It, it's obviously when we are doing. Uh, environmentally adaptive sampling, collaboration, uh, etc. It's absolutely crucial that you have high fidelity simulations of the environment. Um, so, and it has to support. So, the simulator has to be able to support both the adaptive and the collaborative uh, uh, aspects. So, this is the way we do this. I mentioned earlier that each uh, that each node has an autonomy system that only has three connections to the outside world: the modem the uh, vehicle dynamics, um, which we call the front seat driver, and the sensors. So this is what happens in the real ocean. Messages are passed from acoustic modem to, a, uh, to an acoustic modem on another vehicle or up to, uh, to the top side, and that's basically the environment we are, we are dealing with. Now, in the, how do we simulate that? A little more complicated, but basically the same idea, because we want to make sure that we have exactly the same software running in the payload um, that we would have in the real experiment, because that's the only way you can guarantee that it's going to work exactly the same way you, when you get out in the ocean. So then what we need is simulators for the sensors, for the dynamics, and for the motors. So the way we do that is we have a separate uh, uh, computing environment that is running ocean models, in this case the MCs, uh, uh, the, uh, the MIT uh, Ocean Circulation Model, that's generating uh, realizations of a virtual ocean with currents, temperatures, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we have acoustic models. So, for instance, when we, um, when we, have, when we want to communicate from, uh, from one vehicle to the other, from this case, if MACO wants to uh, communicate with Hammerhead, the, the modem, um, the, mo the message is sent to the modem as if it was a regular modem, but without totally transparent to the payload autonomy that actually goes over into this central environment that's running a communication model that is modeling the uh, um, the uh, the range of the communication the uh, um, uh, the uh, success rate of the messages etc and then it predicts whether hammerhead is going to receive it or not if hammerhead is going to receive it then it sends it uh, to, uh, to Hammerhead. And the same with the acoustic sensing. We sent requests over that then uses the ocean models uh, to uh, uh, update the environment, run the acoustic models uh, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the sensor system. So then I have some, a few minutes for a, a, few, uh, a few examples. Um, and uh, the, um, the, the first one is something that's really actual. It's, uh, we're going back to the Arctic. Haven't been back there for, for it's 20 years ago. We had the last last ice camp um, with the MIT group doing Arctic acoustics. We now have an opportunity for uh, for going back. So one of the things we then are looking at is uh, how do you um, um, how do you uh, uh, localize an acoustic source? Uh, and the one we are after, specifically after in this case is identifying uh, regions of this of the ice cover that are that are active. Because that'll tell us something about what is breaking away and uh, becoming a danger for shipping, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and for in general for understanding the uh, the change in the uh, uh, in the environment. The Arctic environment is uh, characterized by this mono this monotonically increasing sound speed profile, which creates this propagation environment uh, <coughs> that uh, here we have in the contours in uh, uh, in dB of uh, of transmission loss. The source is up here and. The, uh, the color indicates the, uh, uh, indicates the level. And we see some, we have some shadow zones here and there. So the idea then is now how do, if we have an AUV down there somewhere at some depth, uh, and we, um, we want to localize and track some of these uh, active ice, uh, ice zones, where should we put ourselves in the water column uh, to, uh, to, uh, to get that, get the longest range of the uh, um, uh, of the uh, uh, of the tracking of that uh, of that ice event, um, and um, not only is that dependent on transmission loss, it also is dependent on the ambient noise. So the ambient noise is playing into the uh, picture as well. So all this again, remember, we ha the vehicle has to be able to do this without communicating with anybody. So how do we do that? Well, we do that with this onboard modeling uh, and uh, prediction infrastructure. So we have a sound speed profile um, 
we have some noise, so historical noise uh, data versus, uh, versus depth. Uh, this shows a typical uh, um, a deep sea uh, noise, uh, uh, noise level uh, profile versus depth. Um, and then we use the acoustic models then with that sound speed profile to predict the, uh, the propagation. And in this case, it tells us that to reach that, uh, uh, to, to reach that, um, uh, that event in the ice, um, which happened to be at 45 kilometer distance at this point, uh, I have to be at a depth of about 2,000 uh, 2, meters. Um, and, uh, uh, and then uh, if, if I, uh, and so what we do then is translate that into an objective function for, uh, uh, for, for depth, which uh, the captain of the ship will see then and say, okay, here's my peak. I go to 4,000 meter depth and that's where I'm gonna, uh, that's where I'm gonna be. Um, the, uh, we do that with this infrastructure on board, again, running moose uh, as a middleware and we have a modeling infrastructure using the bellhop acoustic model for doing onboard real-time uh, real simulations. Um, and this is just an example from the simulator of what the vehicle was doing for tracking uh, an acoustic source uh, to long uh, ranges. Let me just finish up with this, uh, this last one. The, um, um, I think I have a couple of minutes yet. Is that correct, Andrea? Mine says 38. Um, the, uh, um, so the traditional way of towing an array uh, is with a, the array being horizontal. If you talk to submariners, uh, they'll tell you, well, if the array isn't horizontal, it's really useless. So what, again, I mentioned this idea of, uh, uh, of thinking out of the box. Uh, with the AOV, we have the locks here. We can really, we can yo-yo. So why not yo-yo with that towed array? So instead of then measuring the, uh, uh, the we have this co cone ambiguity of a towed array, um, and we, want, we would like to know what does the noise picture look like in the horizontal and in the vertical. Uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't tell us that much because it, it, we have this ambiguity between horizontal <laughs> and vertical, sorry. Um, if we do it this way, we can break that, uh, that ambiguity. So this is, how the, uh, this is how that sound picture, the sound vertical, horizontal, for an, uh, for an acoustic source in the ice. Um, we see we have these two peaks, peaks uh, but they're smeared out. In this case, we are doing a horizontal survey with the total array. If we do the yo-yo, this is what we get. So now we really split them up. And if we compare the two, you'll see the, uh, the peak we are getting is, uh, first of all, very narrow, it's much narrower for the yo-yo, but even more importantly, the peak is three to, three to six dB higher. So by doing a yo-yo instead of doing a horizontal uh, survey, we can get three to six dB higher uh, signal excess, which is absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely tremendous. I had some stuff on uh, uh, on machine learning. I'm uh, uh, I'm going to bypass uh, bypass that because I'm already uh, uh, over uh, over time. But it's basically more of the same uh, uh, more of the same message. So let me just uh, go go back to the. John Delaney's, I, ha I, ha I have to, uh, to show this. So, oh, sorry. So, so this is uh, some work we are currently doing on, uh, uh, on swarm autonomy. Um, so the question is how, if we have a swarm of, uh, uh, of underwater vehicles, um, each of them carrying some sensor, or sonographic sensor, acoustic sensor, whatever, uh, and we want to them fly in a certain formation uh, in a current field uh, that is Highly inhomogeneous, highly stratified. What is, uh, uh, how is that uh, uh, happening? And we've developed uh, autonomy, or we currently are developing autonomy for doing that using navigation uh, only or to the closest neighbors. We're talking to, about communicating with a few hundred, within a few hundred meters using high frequency acoustics um, and uh, then navigating the whole swarm uh, with only relative, uh, uh, relative navigation. And this is the, uh, my version of John Delaney's, of John Delaney's movie. So here, these, uh, these, uh, uh, the mode is, it's set up for is each, and each vehicle is communicating with its closest, closest neighbor um, every 30 seconds, uh, and they are instructed to make this formation that looks like an arrow. Uh, so you, I think you can see this, you can see this, uh, uh, see this arrow. And now this is a current field that's now moving this formation. Uh, along and every 30 seconds they get a measurement of range and bearing to a, a few of its neighbors and then they correct. This is done in 50, 50 times uh, uh, magnification of the, uh, uh, of, the uh, of the speed. 
So, um, as I said, I am, no, I am notorious for going, going over time, so let me just go on to, I want to say a few words about, if, I, if you'll allow me, Andrea, of uh, talking about education, because this, we have this new class that really is focusing on these concepts uh, of on the interplay between communication, uh, sensing, and, uh, and autonomy. Uh, and uh, we just uh, finished, uh, finished last, last week um, with the students having a competition where they are actually, they have, we, we generate, in the simulator, we generate a, a front, uh, and you can see it's a moving front, it's a sinusoidal shape. The students don't know what the actual period, uh, wavelength, etc., cetera, is. Uh, it can, and it can look like this, it can look like that. But they have to estimate these nine parameters uh, characterizing, the, uh, characterizing the front. And uh, these, the, a couple of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the students came up with this one, and this is really the essence of uh, doing adaptive uh, ocean sampling. First, the vehicle is running around in a circle, estimating the slope of the front, that's this line. Then uh, once that's estimated, it goes in and does an adaptive survey along the front, back and forth. Uh, and it's doing that with basically building three, uh, uh, three autonomous, uh, uh, autonomous behaviors. And uh, uh, they, uh, they do that first in simulation, and, uh, and then, they, uh, oops. then they do it on the river with the, uh, uh, with the surface craft, and uh, then that's... There they go. So they, uh, so then, and then of course what they discover is that when they're running in the simulator, they can run a time warp of 30 or 50, and uh, if something doesn't work, oops, then we do control C and re restart, and uh, once they're out there and they're running with no time warp, uh, it's too late. That you can, the, you, the autonomy system really has to be able to do the whole thing on its own. So that leads me finally to the, uh, uh, to the summary, uh, and uh, the, uh, I think the, the main, um, the, the main thing, I, the main takeaway take is that uh, the, uh, the autonomy really is uh, a key to developing a persistent ocean observation system uh, because of, it, of this uh, really uh, constrained commu uh, communication environment that we are, uh, we are facing. That is the main driving force. Thank you. I'm sorry for going to the conference.